I'm so delighted to be able to speak to the Millbrook community today. Uh, before I start, I just want to say uh, how proud I am as a Millbrook alum of the Millbrook community for enduring through such a difficult uh, stretch of time uh, in regards to the pandemic. Uh, but also, uh, I'm very proud of Millbrook's response. Uh, to what I perceive as an overdue awakening in our country uh, as it pertains to racism in America. Uh, I graduated in 2013, uh, as you heard from Daniel and Mr. Castitano, and uh, although it was uh, a little bit ago, I still remember uh, getting ready for chapel talks every week. Uh, I lived in Harris and Prum for most of my time at Millbrook, and it seems like just yesterday. As I look back at my time at Millbrook, uh, I, at this point, now look at it as the single most informative and really transformative period in my life thus far. And that's for a couple of reasons. First, academically, I've never been challenged as I uh, had at Millbrook up until that point. Uh, I've never had professors and faculty who were willing to invest in my own academic growth. So for me, uh, I experienced a lot of kind of first time, positive first time experiences in the classroom, uh, which were very memorable. But in addition to the academic experiences, uh, the social experiences that I had at Millbrook I would say left an um, indelible mark on, on my life uh, in many different ways. Obviously, uh, I'm sure all of the students know that uh, when you're at Millbrook, uh, you just come across so many different kinds of people, people who have different backgrounds, who have different uh, upbringings from yourself, uh, people all around the country and abroad. And uh, that's what you hear about. Uh, when you first visit Millbrook um, and you talk to faculty and students, you learn that it is a unique uh, environment where there are diverse perspectives um, and, and backgrounds, which I think uh, is a strength of Millbrook's. But when I talk about social experiences, um, particularly for the purpose of this chapel talk, um, I'm talking about a social experience, frankly, that uh, no one talked about. That nobody prepared me for, and if I'm being frank, uh, I'm not sure uh, anyone could have prepared a 14-year-old uh, Black student for. And these are experiences such as being the only Black student uh, in my class up until my final year at Millbrook. These are experiences like uh, having my classmates call me the N-word and other racial slurs. These are experiences like having to explain to my peers why it, isn't, it is not a privilege for my family to have come to this country as slaves. These are the social experiences that really have left such a mark on my life to this day. And as I reflect on that experience at 14 years old, I really describe it as essentially a masterclass in what racism, ignorance, and hatred could look like. And it really took me quite some time to think about those experiences and unpack them both emotionally and intellectually. And when I now reflect on those experiences, I'm talking to all of you, um, I just want to tell you about the, the pain that those experiences caused. Uh, to this day, I can still remember all of the emotions um, that I felt during all of those different experiences. Uh, I remember the embarrassment. I remember the anger. I remember the confusion that I felt at 14 um, during all of those different incidents. Um, but now, I, when I think about those emotions, I recognize that those emotions aren't directed towards the small group of individuals because it, it, was, it was a small group of individuals who engaged in racist behavior. But 
I also have a lot of emotions um, that are directed towards the bystanders because at all the incidents that I just described, there were bystanders. There were people who watched uh, the racist behavior. There were people who watched the traumatic incidents. Um, and those by bystanders, for the most part, were my peers, classmates, friends, uh, truly decent people um, who observed all of this. And, and these are people who chose to look the other way. These are people who decided not to speak up. These are people who might have decided to leave the room without uttering a word. And these are people who, frankly, did not openly rebuke racism or racist behavior. And so a lot of the emotions that come up when I think about those experiences are directly related to why that didn't happen. But there's one big thing that I want you guys to remember is that racism truly flourishes when it's unchallenged, when it's left alone, and when it's thought about as if it's just a normal part or a regular part of our society. You see, I can still recall, recall to this day, my first time actually in the student center. So now you guys have a nice student center. It's, real, it's very fancy. I know it's the, it was the hangout spot when I was there, um, but we had an older student center, but it was still the spot for students to hang out. And I recall my first time visiting, visiting it. I was 14 years old. Uh, it was my first week on Millbrook's campus. And as all third formers do, uh, we traveled as a unit. Uh, we traveled as a pack and everyone decided that day after dinner, we were going to visit the student center. And I remember walking to the student center with my classmates and taking a seat. And I really was just taking everything in. I was, I was observing the environment I was watching upperclassmen interact with each other. And up until that point, I had a relatively positive experience. And I remember two fifth formers approaching me and they had a rope. And I remember the rope was tied in what, is, what was essentially looked like a noose. And I can recall at that moment, it seemed as though time stood, stood still for the most part. It seemed as if all attention began to shift towards what was going on. Everyone seemed to wonder what was going to happen next. I remember that the rope was thrown and thank God it missed. But at that moment, my mindset changed completely. See, before my mindset, uh, when I entered Millbrook was for me to merely enjoy the privilege of attending the school and interacting with uh, many different people and many different perspectives. But at that moment, it completely flipped to a focus just on surviving the next three years. I no longer felt safe. And I knew that my experience was going to be drastically different from what I initially had thought. And I remember running away as fast as I could. And all the emotions that I felt at that time. I was fearful. I was embarrassed. In many ways, I was angry as well. I was fearful because I kept replaying what would have happened if that rope would have made it around my neck. I was embarrassed because I have never felt that weak or vulnerable in my life. And to this day, I don't think I felt that weak. And I was angry because there were so many of my friends, classmates, and just other colleagues who were in that student center at the time who didn't speak up. 
No one said, hey, this isn't right. No one tried to mitigate the situation or interject. Everyone kind of simply watched everything unfold. And it's those experiences, as long with the time I spent speaking with my own community and understanding the pain and what's going on that really led me to go to law school. And it really is for one simple reason, uh, to be an advocate for dif disenfranchised communities, as well as to never be a bystander. I never wanted to be complicit um, with racism or racist structures. And so I went to law school looking to accomplish that, that mission. And in law school, I did a number of different things to try to accomplish that goal. My first year, uh, I was able to start a book club at Rikers Island. If you don't know, Rikers Island is a jail. Um, it's literally on an island close to the Bronx. And it's meant uh, as a temporary holding, uh, primarily for individuals who haven't been convicted of a crime yet. So these are people who are innocent and who do not have enough money to pay for bail. And I watched through experiences such as the book club, society's ambivalence and silence normalize the fact that thousands of black and brown bodies are being put in cages simply because they are poor. I watched society's ambivalence and silence allow for pregnant women at Rikers to be chained to beds, mostly black women, in immeasurable pain because they're not able to receive the medication that they need. I watched, and we all watched, kind of societies and bibles and silence allow for the killing of George Floyd. And in many ways, those instances have been normalized. I know some people think that what happened to George Floyd was a singular moment, but I would point to a long list of events in history that say otherwise. Uh, one of my favorite lawyers, Brian Stevenson, who is a renowned attorney, uh, who is known for representing individuals on death row, uh, that's individuals who are uh, able to get the death penalty. He talks a lot about the fact that everyone in the United States needs to go through a truth telling process in order for us to have real progress. And this truth telling progress acknowledges that there is a common thread throughout US history that involves racism. If you need more examples, look up the story of Khalif Browder, Browder who committed suicide after being wrongfully accused and put at Rikers Island uh, as a child. Go look up the story of the Exonerated Five or otherwise known as the Central Park Five. You can Google uh, what's going on in Angola prison, which is a prison in Louisiana. And they have probably the most horrific conditions that I've heard about in my lifetime, made up of predominantly of black and brown people. Historically, you can look at uh, what happened in Oklahoma with the Tulsa race massacre. You can still watch video clips of that community talk about how painful that was. If you don't know, that was a massacre of essentially hundreds of black people just for essentially uh, doing well economically. And that community is still feeling that type of pain. So there is a clear pattern throughout American history that is deeply entrenched in racism, violence, and hatred. And to move on from that, we must acknowledge it as a, as a society. In my opinion, there might always be some degree of bias, racism, prejudice in our society because we live in a complex and complicated world. We all know that. However, what I believe we are beginning to see today in this country is that collectively, our society is struggling to determine whether we will defiantly and unapologetically challenge racism in all its forms and begin to protect those that have had to bear the, 
the weight of that since the very beginning. Because at the end of the day, I truly believe that silence and collective indifference that has impeded progress far more than racist individuals. You see, after three years of law school, I would like to say I learned a couple of things, but the most important thing that I would like to uh, share with all of you is that lawyers, politicians, multimillionaires, they can't solve these issues. There is simply no replacement for empathetic and active community members. People who truly care about others, people who truly care about other individuals who don't have similar backgrounds, similar experiences. But this, so this realization did give me some hope. And so this isn't supposed to be a, a talk that is full of hopelessness at all. Um, in fact, uh, I think it's the exact opposite because I think what we're seeing today is a reckoning within our country. And this reckoning, I think, uh, impressively is being driven by people like you, young people, everyday people who live in this country have just decided that they're no longer going to turn the other way in regards to racism. And I want to impress upon all of you guys how much power you guys have. You guys are all able to drastically change the future and it begins in your daily lives. It begins with the community that you guys choose to build at Millbrook. You guys should all be aiming to create a community at Millbrook that you would like to see in the real world. And I know your professors and Millbrook's administrators are all doing all, are doing all they can to create a diverse and inclusive environment. But at the end of the day, the people who are able to really impact culture and community, it's gonna be the students, it's gonna be you guys. And I have no doubt that all of you are up for the challenge. Um, I have a lot of faith in all of you. Uh, I'm gonna conclude because I wanna take questions if there are any, but I have just three pieces of advice that I'd like to share for all of you, to all of you um, as you progress in uh, life's journey. The first, don't rely on others to lead the way. Uh, at Columbia, I spoke to a lot of my peers and we realized that, you know, traditionally we're used to looking to our politicians, celebrities, business leaders to set the tone on how we want our society to work. I think if all of us hold ourselves accountable, that we all individually take the lead and become the example of how we want others to act, that you're gonna be able to see positive change on a large scale. The second is unpack whatever preconceived notions you might have, recognize privilege and your own privilege, and realize that we are able to shape society. Society is dictated by our actions. In terms of unpacking preconceived notions, I think the benefit of going to a school like Millbrook is the fact that there are so many different cultures and perspectives. But you might come into this environment with some preconceived notions that might be incorrect. That's okay. But I think we need to learn how to take a step back, talk to others, listen, have respectful conversations, and figure out if however whatever notions you might have are accurate. In terms of privilege, I think we need to begin to normalize, recognizing and accepting that I think everyone has privilege in some aspect. That's not a bad thing. What's important is how you use your privilege. And the last thing in terms of acknowledging and realizing that we are the ones shaping society, uh, I'm sure you guys heard it when I was younger, I was always told, well, can't solve homelessness, can't solve poverty. Now I've gotten older, I, I've understood that that's a choice. There are a variety of ways to tackle these issues. And the main thing is to focus on if collectively, 
That is a goal we want to achieve. And the last thing is just speak up and stand up when you see something going on, particularly as it relates to, to racism, but this can be applicable in a variety of different cases. I truly believe that my freshman year or third form experience, excuse me, would not have happened if at least one person would have said, you know, this is not the type of community that we're about. All it took was one person. And I think don't underestimate the power that you guys all have when you use your voice. So with that, um, happy to answer questions. Again, I'm just incredibly proud of you guys for sticking through uh, this academic semester. And I just can't wait to see uh, what all of you guys do moving forward. So.